talking about very young children because that's when these cases begin and I'd like my first slide to show you some of the things that these young children may say uh, this is by no means a complete list but uh, such remarks as when I was big I was an airplane pilot they may fill it out in different ways the rejection of the mother the disparagement of the immediate surroundings of the child and something about what the child claims to have done previously. Let me show you uh, and tell you briefly about one case. It'll give you a kind of feel. Yes. Uh, this is a child of Lebanon a Druze. It's a sect originally of Islamic origin, but now they consider themselves separately. She's uh, there about 18 months old, picking up the telephone and calling into it, Layla, Layla, Layla. When she could speak more, she spoke about a previous life uh, as a middle-aged married woman who had children, one of whom was called Layla. And this deceased woman had died not long before our subject here was born. And she actually happened to die in Richmond, Virginia, where she'd come for cardiac surgery. Here's the little girl when I first met her. Sorry, the slide isn't better. And she's here uh, between six and seven years old still speaking fluently about the previous life, still attached not only to the children of the deceased woman, but also to the husband of the deceased woman, whom she used to call three or four times a day to ask about how he is, his health, what was going on. Immensely jealous when he seemed to show some interest in a neighbor who had been a friend of the deceased woman and ultimately married that person. Here she is at the age of about 25 as a young lady, still unmarried, still very attached to the husband of the deceased woman. And here's the deceased woman herself. This case uh, illustrates not only the statements that these children make, but the behavior, the unusual behavior, the involvement with the other family. And that's a point that I will be emphasizing repeatedly during my remarks. It's, a, it's part of a lesson for myself because when I first began studying these cases, I thought they would consist only of statements that the child made and all you had to do was verify those and make sure the child couldn't have learned about the other person normally. But there is much more to the cases than that, as I subsequently discovered. This slide outlines what one might find in a case that was fully rich with all, all the ingredients that we have found. Sometimes 
Persons involved in these cases make predictions of another life. Sometimes there's a dream, uh, usually by a mother-to-be, about who's coming back. Then the baby is found to have certain congenital anomalies, birthmarks and birth defects. Then come the statements that the child makes. And finally, an array of unusual behavior almost always manifests. The behavior might include phobias and aversions, phobias of the instrument of death or of the sight of the death, such as a place where a drowning occurred. Equally prominent are phileas, especially for foods, for intoxicants like alcohol, tobacco. Then there are disturbances of the relationship between the child and the parent. The child wants to go to the other family often and uh, becomes importunate about this. One child whose case I'll mention in a little while was so determined to go to the family where she claimed to belong that she actually fasted to the point of malnourishment and had to be admitted to a hospital. She went on a, a food strike. Sometimes uh, there are unusually strong uh, relationships that correspond to relationships between the deceased person and the person to whom the child is attracted or perhaps repelled. Some of the children show vengefulness or tendencies toward criminal behavior that correspond to events in the previous life that they claim to remember. Play in childhood is, is uh, common among these children and it uh, corresponds to the vocation, sometimes the avocation of the deceased person. Now, where are the cases found most readily? Let me first uh, clarify that we have no knowledge, almost no knowledge, of the real incidence of these cases. So what I'm talking about here are where we can find the cases and what parts they are reported. And uh, the, uh, they're found most readily in Southeast Asia, especially in the Ganges Valley of India and uh, Burma, Thailand, also in Sri Lanka. They're found abundantly in West Africa and in Northwest North America among the tribes there. But they are also found in other countries, uh, including Western Europe and North America. And I have a book now just about to go to press on cases in Europe. The cases in Europe, to some extent, um, indeed to a considerable extent, uh, show features similar to those of the cases we've studied uh, in Asia. Now I want to say a few words about how we go about investigating these cases. The principal instrument of investigation is uh, interview. But they must be interviews with qualified people, which means first-hand informants. We try to set aside uh, second-hand informants who will often narrate something they heard or imagined themselves. We allow the informants to talk freely at first and then come in with questions about details. The interview ultimately becomes uh, somewhat scheduled in that we have a checklist of items that we want to cover about details. The recording of the interviews is uh, rarely done with tape recorders. Most often we make notes as the interpreter uh, translates for us. We need interpreters in, in Asia. And handwritten notes enable us to uh, record uh, many details that might be missed in uh, tape recording. 
Then printed and written documents have become of special importance in the last 15 years when we've given more attention to the cases with birthmarks and birth defects because we've sought uh, autopsy reports and been successful in uh, some 65 or 70 cases in obtaining those. Uh, that consumes an immense amount of time. Uh, one has to drink cups of coffee with the bureaucrats who <laughs> have access to the records and then uh, perhaps in addition give a, uh, an American-made shirt to the clerk who will actually find the record. But it's all very worthwhile because a, uh, a, an autopsy report in black and white, obviously made before the child in question was born and in many cases we, most cases we find a close correspondence between the post-mortem report and the birthmarks and birth defects. And I'll come to that later. Then more recently uh, we have been concerned with psychological tests. These were first uh, conducted by our colleague of Iceland uh, Dr. Erlander Haraldson, who did psychological testing in, uh, among cases in uh, Sri Lanka, comparing the subjects with uh, other children of the same age and, and uh, general background. And this kind of program is now being uh, conducted by Dr. Tucker with American children. I'll just show you a few scenes of interviews. It's rather informal. This is a village in India. This is my, myself. This is the witness. We, de we declare one area the witness box, ask everyone else to remain silent, which they usually do. And we say that if they have something to say, we'd be glad to listen to them later. This is a scene in Burma, now Myanmar. The subject is this young man here. This is his wife. And this is myself, busy taking notes. The uh, subject has what can't be seen. He had a prominent birthmark on his head. He remembered the previous life of a man who had been shot by communists and his body thrown into a river. This is another scene in Burma. The subject is this young lady who remembers a previous life as a uh, Japanese soldier and uh, was loaded with Japanese-like traits when she was a child. She gradually became pretty well Burmified. Uh, this man behind, beside her is totally blind, but notwithstanding that, he accompanied me uh, wading through rivers and cr crossing desert plains and was very zealous in finding cases for us and acting as interpreter. Uh, this is Uwin Mong, my principal interpreter in Burma. The crowd again is typical, but uh, very congenial and mostly uninterfering. I want to say something about the alternative uh, ways of analyzing the data. We, we can look at each individual case and consider alternative interpretations for it. And we can also look at groups of cases. We have plenty of them now, uh, so that for some countries like India, we have some 400 cases and for Burma even more. So it's possible to make uh, analyses of the cases within a country and then to do cross-cultural comparisons. And what we found is that uh, if you look at the cases across all the cultures where we have worked, certain so-called universal features stand out as occurring in all those cases. And other features seem to be culture-bound. I'll say more about the universal features. I put that in quotes because it's a little grandiose and I uh, 
uh, perhaps uh, a little too strong, but it, it is true that we have found these features in all the cases of culture so far studied. This is a list of the possible interpretations of individual cases. Fraud. We have come across a few fraudulent cases. Uh, I published a paper some years back on cases of deception and self-deception. I think they're exceedingly rare. The people involved in these cases uh, don't have the time or the motive to engage in an expensive uh, that is expensive in time, uh, fraud. Fantasy is a problem also, as a possible interpretation. Cryptomnesia, that just means that the child has somehow normally learned the information that uh, he then expresses as memories, but he doesn't remember how he got the information. And paramnesia means that the informants have muddled their memories and given the child more credit than it deserves. The genetic memory I put in for completion, but uh, that's, uh, uh, as I could say, uh, an impossible interpretation of these cases. If I were to coach a skeptic, I would tell him to concentrate on paramnesia, uh, the confusion and um, unconscious editing of the memories of the informants. If you can eliminate all of these possible interpretations, you get down to what we call paranormal processes, like extrasensory perception combined with an identification with a, a, a deceased person, or possession, a discarnate personality influencing a child, imposing memories on it. There are cases that might lend themselves to these two interpretations, and they should be considered. And then we come, would come to the idea of reincarnation only last, if we could eliminate all the other interpretations. This is a uh, kind of a summary of the ways in which we would appraise cases with regard to their uh, strength, the seven statements must correctly correspond to events in the life of only one deceased person. So that requires a fair amount of specificity in the names given. And then the two families concerned should have had no previous knowledge of each other. And then ideally, the subject statements should be recorded before they're verified. Unfortunately, too often the parents, uh, under pressure from the child or influenced by their own curiosity, try to find the other family if the child is given enough indication. And uh, they then carry out their own verifications before we reach the case. Uh, and so that, after all these years, we still have only 35 cases in which the subject statements were recorded before they were verified. Failing that, we can uh, accept a case if we get to it fairly soon, uh, preferably within a few weeks or months of its development. I mentioned these universal features that occur in the cases of all cultures so far studied. The very young age of starting to speak uh, is one of them, and then the age of discontinuing the spontaneous references usually five to seven years. Some children go on longer, and a few even claim to preserve the apparent memories uh, until adulthood. A very high frequency of violent death, it's up around 60% in the deceased persons. And there's a very high frequency of mentioning the mode of death. Nearly all the children uh, say how they died in the previous life. Then, as examples of uh, features that are not universal, I could mention, um, most importantly, sex change. This, there are 
many, many cases of uh, claimed sex change in Burma and Thailand. It's even 26% of the Burmese subjects claim to have been a person of the opposite sex in the previous life. Whereas in Lebanon, uh, it's absolutely unknown. It's also unknown among the cases of the Northwest North America. I thought for years it was uh, unknown also in Turkey, but our colleague, uh, Dr. Kyle, recently told me about a case of uh, sex change type in, in Turkey. Now I want to come to uh, birthmarks and uh, birth defects and uh, show you some examples, particularly of birthmarks. Um, this is a photograph of a, a baker in South Central Turkey, very peace-loving person, earning his living as a baker. Uh, we're still a little bit in touch with him, or at any rate, my colleague, Dr. Kyle, uh, has met him. And uh, he remembered the previous life of the person shown on the next slide. This is a photograph of a no notorious bandit, Jemal Hayek, who um, in the 1930s was highly successful in robbing highway travelers in that part of Turkey, and he hid out in the, in the woods and evaded the police for about uh, three or four years until eventually his uh, hiding place was betrayed. And after a conventional shootout with the police, the police succeeded in setting fire to the house where he had sheltered and he decided uh, that uh, he would kill himself rather than be killed, possibly tortured first and then killed by the police. So he shot himself, uh, putting the muzzle of the gun to his uh, chin and then triggering the, uh, setting off the trigger with his toe. The subject was born with a birthmark that the next slide will show. It's right here. Uh, I thought he had only one birthmark for quite a while. And eventually I met uh, one of the policemen who'd been at the shootout and he, he claimed that he'd been the first person to kick the door of the house open and go in and see the bodies. And then he described to me with unnecessarily dramatic vividness how <laughs> the bullet had gone right through and had lifted his skull right off the top of his head. Anyway, I, I thought, discounting uh, some of this drama, that this subject should have another birthmark. And uh, so I went back to him and I said, do you have another birthmark? Oh, yes, he said. And here it is. And the next slide shows uh, the artist's reconstruction of the trajectory from here to here of this. Now, it, one of my ambitions is to have this man who still lives in Antakya taken up to Adana, the largest city where there's a medical center, and studied with MRI to see whether there is a track of defective tissue along this line. I haven't been able to do that yet, uh, partly because the neurologist to whom I wrote in and then I never replied to my letter. <laughs> but the, the subject is, uh, is quite amenable to that. And the next slide shows another subject. This is a young boy of Thailand who remembered the previous life of a school teacher who had a sideline in gangsterism and was shot as he was riding his bicycle to work. And this boy had two impressive birthmarks that the next slides show. This one is small and round, and the next slide, that's on the back of the head. The next slide shows the uh, birthmark corresponding to the wound of exit, large and irregular. He's still living in Bangkok, and we also would like to study him with MRI. I didn't have a medical record in this case. The uh, widow of the deceased man who was shot uh, was our informant for the location of the bullet wounds. 
Uh, next one, please. This is a young girl of India. She's the one I mentioned before who went on a food strike and would not eat unless she was taken to the town where she said she lived. They took her to another town and uh, she got very angry about that, said, you're, you're lying, this isn't Kota where I belong, take me to Kota. And eventually they did and verified her statements about having fallen from a height. And the next slide shows the young girl, a cousin, uh, no, sorry, there, no, there was no re relation between these two uh, children at all, but they were playing together, this child and a cousin, uh, above uh, an open area in the house where there was a stairway and a well, but a very low railing. And apparently the two children uh, teasing each other and jostling each other um, d were so in position that one of them toppled over this low railing and landed about uh, three meters below on a hard concrete floor. She was taken to a um, hospital and I did obtain a hospital record that showed she was bleeding from the right ear and uh, she died a few hours later. I presume that she had a, a fracture of the uh, uh, base of the skull and uh, the child, this is the deceased child whose life was claimed to be remembered by our subject. And the next slide shows the birthmark on our subject. It's uh, we're on the right parietal side of the head, corresponding pretty well to the uh, site where the child landed on her head and the pavement below. I've got one last slide uh, that, uh, for which I also have a medical record. Uh, it's rather dark. The boy is here. He's now a youth of 14, I think. He's with my interpreter and his father. And the next slide shows the birthmark he had. Now, this is an area of decreased pigmentation, uh, which is uh, not uncommon among these cases. And I got a, a, an autopsy report in this case, and the, uh, I persuaded the uh, pathologist to helped me find the postmortem report to draw circles of the wounds. It was a, a, a shotgun killing. And the next slide shows the location, the principal wound is here, but as, as you'll know in a shotgun killing, the uh, pellets of the shot disperse. You can tell the distance of the gun from the victim by the dispersion of the wounds. We go back to one slide, you see the, the birthmark here, and then the next slide shows the, <coughs> the location of the wounds. <laughs>